Let's get started. We'll let some people filter in. So welcome to the first uh, WEFI seminar of 2021 or whatever year this is anymore. I can't remember. Um, we are happy to have Laura Lindsay here to present some work on uh, small firm finance and in particular using Form D to explore the role of gender and security design. Um, just a reminder on the format. So we have a 40 minute presentation and we're now in meeting form. So we encourage you to use the chat to uh, ask clarifying questions. Uh, Laura's co-author is here and we'll manage the clarifying questions. And then about every 10 to 15 minutes, uh, Laura will pause and see if there are any bigger questions. Um, and then after that, we'll have our 15 minute discussion and our Q and A. So I think with that, I'm ready to hand it off to Laura. Thanks for being here. So uh, thanks everyone. I am uh, happy to uh, join you today. Let's see if this works. Aha, uh -huh, excellent. Um, so as Mike alluded to, this paper is on discrimination in early stage finance uh, and gender discrimination potentially in particular. And uh, the paper is co-authored with uh, Luana Zakaria who is uh, joining us from from Rome today, I believe. So most people who are joining us are probably familiar with something called the entrepreneurship gender gap. And that can mean a couple of different things. Um, on the one hand, it can mean that females enter into entrepreneurship uh, lower than the proportion in the population. Depending on how one measures, that gender gap isn't so large in the US. So according to the National Association of uh, Women Business Owners, about 40% of US small businesses are owned by women. However, when one looks at census data, for example, where uh, businesses need to have employees, the number goes down to something in the 20% range. And then if one looks at firms that receive external finance from venture capitalists, uh, it, the, the proportion of women um, on founding teams um, gets smaller still and maybe on the order of about 15%, though by some measures that's improving in, in recent years. So why should we care? Well, um, as financial economists, not as just humans who care about fairness, we care because there's a, an efficiency argument for um, to be anti-discrimination, right? So if talent is evenly distributed, any barriers that distort um, choices distort outcomes. So, um, and in high growth entrepreneurship, you know, entrepreneurial talent may or may not be evenly uh, distributed, right? When you, when you have these right tail outcomes. Um, so it, it's important to look at to what extent uh, barriers might be happening in the, in the finance markets. Uh, we know that financing constraints are important for entry into entrepreneurship. And so it's important to see if, if there's a big barrier at the financing stage or if this barrier happens much sooner, right? So there are lots of places um, where choices can be distorted for entrepreneurial entry. And of course the first uh, WEFI uh, lecture was on discrimination. And so um, Mike did a, a, a wonderful job with the larger literature on discrimination. And so, you know, education choices, uh, social norms for work in the home, you know, there are all sorts of reasons that uh, women might not be entering high growth entrepreneurship. And so we're just touching one facet of that today, which is uh, to what extent we think financing might, might play a role. So our innovation, if you will, is gonna be to focus on security choice. And I, I think we're the first people to do this. So we're gonna look at um, security choices conveying information that was un is unobservable to the econometrician, uh, but that was available and observable by investors at the time of funding. So you can think of this as debt conveying some sort of information about the nature of assets, for example, or other uh, characteristics of the firm. Uh, our framework is going to model a very particular form of bias, and it simultaneously affects both the choice of security and the investment decision. And what that allows us to do is to uh, look at the set of firms that receive financing as opposed to those that apply for financing and then may or may not receive it and be able to infer something. And so um, we may be the first people to do uh, that as well. And so 
like a lot of work in this area, we assume that the eventual outcomes are not affected by this bias. And that may be an innocuous assumption, but it, but it, or it could be an important one. And we'll have to revisit that um, at, at, at the end. The other interesting thing that's um, useful about the entrepreneurial finance setting is if you go back to the larger discrimination literature, uh, it's very hard to distinguish different types of discrimination. But it, because of stage financing and because we're keying off of the security choice, we're able to see if there are gender differences that persist along the financing path. And so that's going to allow us, we think, to inform the type of discrimination. And so as you can see from the title, we think that this is not necessarily a taste-based phenomenon, but rather a, a mistake-based phenomenon where investors are misinterpreting uh, the, or or um, are, are biased in, with respect to the signal that they receive about these firms. And so the particular form of bias that we model can lead to overfunding or underfunding of entrepreneurial teams with, with women, depending on the type of the project. And so in particular, they are going to overestimate the contribution of capital, the firm value for, for teams with, with a female. And you can think of this as a jockey versus horse question revisited where um, you know, entrepreneurial talent is more important if the team is all male, whereas the, the firm idea in optimal managing of that idea is more important if the team uh, has a female present. So here's a, a, a new stylized fact, which is that there are gender differences in the use of debt. And this comes from a checkbox on the form D filings. And it's across all types of debt, whether debt is um, used in combination with other securities, um, whether it's straight debt. And you might be thinking, well, Laura, that's great. That's a new stylized fact, but it's not a very interesting one because you know, if we know anything from other literatures like sociology and psychology, it's that maybe women are more risk averse or they have this relative underconfidence. And so there might be something very different about the firms, maybe they're, um, safer or lower variance. And so uh, this is exactly what we would expect. So I don't disagree with that at this point. However, if that were the case, we would not expect to see um, the IPO rates for teams with women to be higher than uh, teams without. And so this is an outcome test a la Becker, who famously in the context of loans for um, black borrowers said, don't show me that the observable characteristics of loan applicants are the same and that you know the outgroup is denied more. Show me that those loans are more profitable. And then I'll know it's not statistical discrimination where a characteristic is correlated um, with you know, borrower quality. I'll know that there's actual discrimination in, in the loan market. And so this um, very much looks like underfunding of entrepreneurial teams with, with females. And so just a little bit of a background um, these charts are very much like the um, Ewens and Townsend paper. In, in financial economics, we've tended to think of discrimination as either being statistical, where there's a correlation with a particular characteristic, or as taste-based, where the outgroup just faces a higher bar uh, for funding. And if there's no bias or the discrimination takes the form of being statistical, you, you would expect fewer female founders, but you'd also expect lower value outcomes. Whereas in, under taste-based discrimination, you would expect fewer female founders and a higher value outcome. However, you know, the next picture is gonna be identical with just different labels. You can also have inaccurate beliefs for statistical discrimination, in which case the outcome is going to look just like taste-based discrimination. So if the true distribu distribution is different from the investor's perception, uh, you would also observe fewer female founders and, and higher value outcomes. And so again, the way we're gonna be able to distinguish this is by looking at the staging path um, and, and use of debt um, along the, along the um, staged finance. Now there's no reason why if we, if we flipped the pink and the blue, um, you know, I used my stereotypical colors, uh, there's no reason why um, it's always females that are discriminated against. For certain types of firms, males might face discrimination. And so we're going to argue that there's a segment of projects that are overfunded in, in this data as well. 
and so here's acquisitions. So female um, founded firms are more likely to exit via IPO, but less likely to exit via acquisition. And if we combine those two exits into just exit overall, we see no difference. And so if you don't separate out the type of exit, um, you, you may mask some interesting uh, phenomena. So before I go on, are there any questions thus far? Uh, I think uh, David just points out that this, um, the theme of the paper is similar to um, David Thesmar's work on debt and optimism, but okay. other than that, I don't see any big questions. Can I ask a question? Am I allowed to talk? Of course. You are? <laughs> yes. Okay. So can you uh, explain, so you don't think taste base and in-group bias are in the same category? So in-group bias, in in bias, or this, you're using different language, but the in-group bias, um, you know, your beliefs are wrong about women, whatever. Um, I always view that as a form of taste based. It's just not as conscious, right? Isn't that not? It doesn't really matter for what you're saying. I just I, I understand what you're saying. You're saying that if you if you're so think of it as you know if we were an economist, we are economists. So think of it as you're willing to give up money because you hate working with women, versus if you knew that they would make you lots of money, you'd be willing to work with them. So that's the difference. Like, I don't see, you know, maybe I'm too optimistic, but I don't see taste-based discrimination as surviving in financial markets very long because I think greed overrides distaste uh, very quickly. Um, but you're right that stereotypes um, lead to discrimination, and but that's not taste-based. Like it, it, if the investor had the correct signal, the investor would make the optimal decision. That's the right. difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. It, I just, it falls under the everything else goes through in taste yeah. base and and this and what you're saying it's just it's not intentional yeah and, and now that i'm on the literature slide it it might be a good time to bring up that you know in group and out group is a can be a form of um taste based discrimination where you just like working with your own type and so we we're um not focused on whether the financier for example is female or not we know that that's important from you know, Mike's work and um, uh, several other papers, but, you know, in-group, out-group or homophily can, can have, a, have a role here as well. Yeah. So, anything else? Okay, so um, we're not the first people to look at gender in entrepreneurial finance, of course. We know that there are gender differences. Um, women face higher prices in uh, getting bank loans. Uh, they raise, lower amounts in crowdfunding, although they're no less successful at meeting their crowdfunding goals. We know that industry and firm characteristics play a role in terms of whether uh, women receive financing. And uh, this Guzman and Kaczmarczyk paper showed that about two thirds of the differences in the high growth entrepreneurship gender gap can be explained by observables, but there's still this one third remaining uh, that's unexplained and they say is likely due to financing constraints. There's also some very nice experimental evidence or quasi-experimental evidence that shows um, lots of other places in the pipeline where things can go wrong. So the Hal Ananda paper, for example, shows that women might have uh, lower networking abilities or at least uh, less, they're less likely to take advantage of networking opportunities um, using uh, random assignment of judges and pitch competitions. Uh, the Who and Ma paper, which is really quite interesting, shows that um, if there's a woman on a team, uh, perhaps she's ignored. Yet, if it, the, the team is all women, then they, they face a, a higher bar or a greater uh, sensitivity to how uh, positive they are. So, you know, there's evidence of uh, discrimination from, from other places as well. More, more broadly, I'll, I, I refer, you to, uh, refer you to Mike's uh, workshop. Um, for the background on, you know, women in labor markets, the older literature on, on discrimination. Um, and, and I just want to say that our, our work does rely on prior work on exit strategy. So the idea that um, certain types of firms where entrepreneurial talent will be more relevant are uh, more naturally suited for exit via IPO. 
where they remain independent, whereas other types of firms where entrepreneurial talent is less important might be better suited for uh, acquisition. So uh, we're relying on that um, quite, quite, uh, quite strictly in the model, but a little bit more relaxed when we go to the data. And then of course we also um, contribute to the literature and um, take as relevant the literature on, on venture debt, although our, our flavor is a little bit different. So what do we find? We find that debt is uh, more likely when the founding team has a female, but this difference only is in the early stages. And consistent with prior literature, we also see that females raise less capital, but these differences are persistent and, and the uh, round amounts are outside of our model. So we won't have anything to say about that other than our results are consistent with other literature. We don't find any difference in overall success rates, as I've already said, uh, but it looks like females may be underfunded with respect to high growth. Well, I shouldn't say high growth. With respect to um, projects where entrepreneurial talent is important. So they uh, are more likely to exit via IPO, but they're less likely to uh, exit via acquisition. And so this is consistent with some evidence on, um, you know, uh, pitch competitions, again, where the questioners ask more upside and idealistic questions of teams with all male founders, whereas women are asked um, more downside protection questions. And so our, our work uh, very much fits into that, uh, the flavor of that, um, that observation. So with, with this audience, it's um, probably easier to convince you that traditional capital structure models are less relevant. Um, but, you know, information could play a role, tax differences or, or um, debt as a disciplining device could play a role. Um, but what clearly is relevant is the large literature in security design. And in, in this setting, um, usually the double moral hazard model is the workhorse model and effort is not in our model. So um, some of you might not be happy about that. But of course, we think effort matters. We're just um, going to take a very simple approach uh, to start. And then we'll circle back to alternative theories and figure out what the implications might be if um, there are more com complex uh, alternative explanations going on. So our model is going to have um, two inputs, capital and what we call entrepreneurial talent. So don't think of this as units of labor. Think of it as uh, special sauce, if you will. Uh, the value of the firm is going to depend on the ratio of um, the proportion of that uh, capital and talent and their relative productivities. So um, the productivity is given by beta and lambda and the capital share is uh, alpha with the remainder one minus alpha. So the, the form of bias we consider is on that alpha term. So the investor is going to receive a signal on alpha where they may overestimate the relative contribution of capital to, to firm value. And this is gonna result in a larger use of debt funding. And why? Because liquidation is going to partly preserve the capital but destroy the talent. And so our assumption is that there's something to recover at the intermediate stage. Um, and, and, and so that that's, that's the, the benefit of using debt in this environment. Um, and so that's gonna to lead to overinvestment in projects with a larger estimated capital productivity because firm value is increasing in that capital share. And so you don't get that if there's a bias on the relative productivities because firm value is increasing in both productivity parameters. So like a lot of entrepreneurial uh, models, we have a experimentation phase and a commercialization phase. And um, so you can think of experimentation as being successful with probability P and if experimentation is successful, there's a follow on round at time one, and then there's um, values realized at time two. If, um, if there's a follow on round, the value at time two is greater than zero, and it may or may not be above a certain threshold to observe an exit. And if there's no successful commercial uh, experimentation, uh, the value is going to be zero at, at time two. So conditional on uh, successful experimentation and the receiving of the, the second round, the value at uh, time two is just like um, 
the initial firm value, except there's that little step up parameter for the contribution of capital. So that's the percentage increase over the first round capital that um, the firm receives. And um, ev everything else is, is the same. And so we introduced this idea of project type. So a project type is gonna depend on the relative um, productivity of entrepreneurial talent versus capital. So it's the ratio of that lambda to, to beta. And so th these may, we may refine the names, but this is what we've come up with um, thus far. You can think of a long shot type project as something where the talent is substantially more productive than the capital and safe bets is something where the capital is substantially more productive than the talent. So you can think of a safe bet project as something where the value just depends on optimally managing assets, whereas the long shot project, something really unique has to happen, right? So a computer doesn't do much on its own, but if someone is a, is a spectacular coder and comes up with a, a new framework, then maybe a, a, a new technology can be developed. So, because the value of the firm with respect to alpha, um, you know, takes the form that you see, the, the long shot firm value is going to be increasing, um, it, sorry, decreasing in capital share and increasing in labor share, whereas the safe bet firm value is going to be increasing in capital share. So, so this is the key tension in our, in our framework. So, an investor is going to receive a signal on alpha. Everything else is uh, common knowledge. And the investor then simultaneously chooses whether or not to invest and chooses the security type. And um, we make a variety of simplifying assumptions that uh, we don't uh, think are, are, are that relevant. So, you know, investors receive all the NPV. Um, we don't have discounting. So, What's the difference between debt and equity in our model? So the key uh, feature of debt in entrepreneurial finance, I think, is the idea of a renegotiation date. So legally, something is debt if it carries an interest payment and it has a maturity date. And in, in entrepreneurial finance, interest is often just accruing in kind and sometimes converts to equity. And especially in the early stages, um, the firm doesn't go bankrupt as long as it can raise more money. So debt is a little bit different than, than in a mature firm in, for firms of, of this type. So, so the crucial difference is going to be this maturity date where debt holders, it's easier for them to pull the plug um, and prevent you know, running out the clock with a zombie, zombie firm with whatever money is left. And so you can think of the debt holders being able to force liquidation. Whereas um, an equity holder um, might be able to, uh, you know, force a liquidation, but it's going to be much more costly to do so. And so, um, and equity holders don't have any liquidation value in, in our model. So depending on the outcome of experimentation, um, debt holders can receive this liquidation value that's proportional to the capital share and the amount uh, contributed, or they contribute uh, follow-on capital at, a, at an extra cost. Therefore, they face this trade-off, um, basically the probability that they're gonna need to ex exercise their liquidation option relative to the cost of providing a follow-on round, and um, therefore are going to choose debt if that signal on alpha, so alpha hat, is greater than that quantity there. So P over one minus P times the cost over the capital com contributed at the first round. We're going to call that quantity little delta. Uh, intuitively, it's probably easiest to think of that delta as the probability that the firm's going to be successful. So think of that as, um, you know, even though it's exactly that mathematical quantity there, think of it as the probability that the firm is successful in experimentation. That'll That'll help the rest of what we do uh, flow pretty easily. So um, the project gets funded if the payoff's weekly positive. If we combine the participation and uh, debt uh, participation constraint and debt optimality, you get that the project receives uh, equity funding if 
the investor chooses to participate and the signal on capital share is less than that quantity delta. And it receives debt funding if the payoff is at least the payoff of equity plus the extra cost of debt and that the signal on capital share is greater than that quantity delta. So that there's, there's something sufficient to recover, if you will. And so um, both the payoff of the security, debt or equity, um, and the investment decision um, are a function of that signal on alpha. So now's an, another good time to stop for questions. I know that that's, uh, I went through things pretty quickly. Uh, yeah, I think Adair has a, a question. I have another question, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so I'm a little confused. So you started out um, with assets that have some recoverability. So that, mm -hmm. then I thought you were mixing small business and and more VC focusing type um, businesses because the startups in the VC seed world don't have much recoverability. So, but then you're talking about, I, I thought you were talking about venture debt as in the stuff that, that I've worked on, the more, more milestone loans that Yale works on as well. The, the, but then you, you're going to be talking about convertible notes, it seems. And so which case, what is the, the, the mechanism, as you pointed out, um, which I'm totally on board, the convertible note, the only difference between the debt and equity versions of those things is the timing thing, the forcing mechanism of time. So I'm a little bit confused about what you want us to take away from that recoverability stuff that you are talking about, so, or is it just priming up us to think about the empirics? So I'm not only talking about convertible debt, um, but I am talking about debt in first rounds. So firms can be of a, a continuum of type. And so you might have some, some boring firms where you're buying hard assets and you might have some high growth firms where uh, it's, it's more like a convertible note. And it's true that, you know, we don't think of there being a ton of hard assets to seize in venture capital firms, but in 2002, you could get really good deals on used computers and air on shares, right? So there are assets to recover. Um, even even with, with venture funding. And our data is not just venture capital, right? It's venture capital plus what I'll call quasi-professional angel deals. So we do see a continuum of those firms. And so just on the margin, think of it as investors missing a little bit and, and, sh and, and thinking that asset intensity or, well, not intensity, but, but just the assets are more important for certain types of firms, depending on the founder mix. But think of it as just general debt. We haven't been so specific yet. Uh, Laura, you got about 13. Uh, I, I know, I have my time timer oh, okay. going. Okay, so um, ba basically long shots are gonna um, receive funding if the talent share is important, whereas safe bets are gonna receive funding if um, the capital share is more important. And there, um, let me just skip to the pictures. So there's gonna be a mix, right? So if Delta is high, everything gets funded with equity. So um, you're, you're, you basically don't think you're gonna to need to, to liquidate. Um, if, if Delta's medium, uh, the safe bets get a mix, whereas long shots are all still funded with equity. And if uh, Delta is low, uh, some long shots are funded with debt, uh, and whereas all safe bets are funded with debt. So, um, exit's going to occur if we exceed some uh, threshold value, and that's going to depend on true alpha instead of perceived alpha. So what are the empirical implications? Well, the empirical implications are that if there's bias that takes that particular form of a shift with a female entrepreneur, um, we expect more IPOs, fewer acquisitions, and debt more likely with, with uh, female firms. Some things outside um, what we've tried to model that are additional implications of this form of discrimination would be that um, successful projects, so acquisitions and IPOs are gonna look different with respect to the fundamentals of the first round, things like revenues, patents, um, Delaware incorporation, things of that nature. And the other thing that comes out of the model is that debt should be negatively correlated with IPO probability. 
turns out it's ambiguously correlated with acquisition prob probability, so we can't put a sign on it. But we're looking for a negative coefficient on debt in, in an IPO equation. So we have Form D data. Think of this as all quasi-professional rounds. Um, we also, we collect information on IPOs from Edgar, uh, acquisitions from Crunchbase, and also link with uh, patent data. Because we're isolating first rounds, we, we drop firms that we can't tell when they started. So our sample is going to build through time. And 2018 reflects a partial year. It's not that financing dropped off a cliff. Uh, the proportion of female founded firms are remarkably stable through our sample period. So at about 16%. Here's where we get the debt versus equity. It's a checkbox on the Form D, so we can observe if debt is um, alone or in combination with other things like an option, which would be like convertible debt, or if it's used in combination with equity, where it would potentially replicate a payoff bundle that's like a convertible preferred security. So this is very crude, but, um, but potentially we can see a lot about what the security type looks like. Here are some summary statistics so you can get an idea of what the controls are in our regressions. Um, we have location, industry, whether or not the firm has revenue, um, patent at first round. A family firm means that two founders have the same surname and uh, number of founders, age, number of investors, things like that. But, um, but the, these are the firm fundamentals uh, rather than the deal fundamentals. And aside about amount, um, in the univariate, there's no statistical difference, but in the, in the regression framework, it is true that controlling for other factors, uh, female firms raise less money. So given their maturity and, and things of that nature. So that's just an aside. So here's our first regression on use of debt. You'll see that the coefficient on the female founder is positive. So debt is more common in the first round. So that's just like the graph I showed you. Uh, other variables have intuitive signs. Um, economic magnitude, uh, about 20%. So the base use of debt is around 16%. So that's a 3% uh, coefficient. Everything's a linear probability model. Um, in columns two through four, what we've done is tried to get our controls a little bit better than these, you know, admittedly crude controls in the Form D data. So in column two, we delete uh, industry equal to other. So we know our fixed effects are doing what they're supposed to be doing. In column three, uh, we delete firms that decline to disclose whether or not they have revenue. And in column four, we put in a forward looking variable for whether or not the firm received a follow on round. And so controlling for all of that, um, we see that that coefficient remains remarkably stable on the female founder. This is debt um, across the different types. So convertible debt is debt plus option. Uh, straight debt is they only check the debt box, um, debt plus other non-equity, and then debt plus equity. And so you'll see that our use of debt effect holds across all, all of these combinations except for debt with equity. And that's important because that would be the, the type of security combination that replicates uh, convertible uh, preferred securities. And, um, and since our distinction is debt versus equity, it's kind of nice for us that that, that coefficient um, comes in as, as noisy. So things that might be correlated with bias, uh, familiarity with um, female entrepreneurs. So there's a higher proportion in California or New York. So maybe this investor should be less biased and maybe they should be less biased if the firm is older and there's more information to observe about the firm. And so we do see attenuated effects in, in those two cases. And the, the industry, um, health and retailing is the highest proportion of female entrepreneurs in our data. And that's a, that's a nod to the Bear paper, uh, but she uh, looks at employment in industries. And so of course we have no industries where there are more than 50% founders. So um, we shouldn't take too much of the fact that we don't find it in industry in, in our data. If we look in um, at second rounds and beyond, we see that uh, the second round interaction coefficient exactly cancels out the debt coefficient for first rounds. And if we look at rounds two through N in columns, it really in column three, we see that uh, the coefficient is no longer significant. So we take that to mean that this 
funding difference is uh, confined to early rounds. And again, we, this is our evidence that discrimination, if, if we buy the model on the use of debt, this is our evidence that uh, it looks like whatever difference is going on is uh, declines as information is produced. And so that's, that's what leads us to, to think that any form of discrimination is likely mistake-based. So now we're gonna look at outcomes. First, intermediate outcomes. So you may recall that in our model, um, the probability of receiving a follow-on round, so whether or not experimentation was successful, uh, was independent of project type. So what you'll see here is the probability of a follow-on round, the amount of capital in the second round relative to the first round, and the time between rounds are no different for teams with female founders or, or teams without. And so uh, that's a, a bit of a validation of, of our model. For exits, uh, you've seen this in, in graph form. You see that um, the female founder coefficient is positively related to IPO, so they're more likely to go IPO. They are, these firms are less likely to be acquired. And um, also note the difference in signs on the fundamental uh, firm characteristics for IPO and acquisition. So uh, Delaware Incorporation, uh, less likely for IPO, more likely for acquisition. Um, presence of revenues have opposite signs. Um, patents at the first round have opposite signs. And so this validates the approach of thinking of project type. It's not the case that IPOs are one kind of good outcome and then acquisitions are just a slightly less good outcome. These look to be of a different type. And then when we control for round size and debt in the last three columns, you'll note that the coefficient on debt is negative and significant as predicted on, by the model. So that helps, um, that's sort of an out of, uh, you know, if, if, if we had been trying to match certain moments of the data, this is one that we weren't trying to match. And then the data just um, uh, produced results that were consistent with what we had modeled. So, other things about uh, IPOs and acquisitions. So there's no difference in time to IPO or acquisition. If anything, the IPOs for uh, entrepreneurial teams with women are of higher quality. Uh, for acquisitions, there's no difference in the price paid when price is disclosed. However, price is more frequently reported uh, for female founded firms in Crunchbase. And one might take that to mean that they might be higher quality on average. So we're, we're still thinking about what that means. So a little bit about alternatives. So we don't think of um, insiders as um, having information and the investors being arm's length and, and not being able to tell um, about the firm and sort of a pecking order theory. But it is possible that there's disagreement about valuation and so that debt could be used to delay valuation as in a convertible note. If that's the case for the use of debt, we would expect debt to be uh, positively associated with uh, fundamentals overall, and that's not what we observed. Tax explanations are less likely uh, to apply here. So as the firm is more likely to get revenue, uh, the differences go away. And we recall that the debt uh, difference happened to be attenuated in uh, states that were, um, that had more female founders, and those happen to be really high tax states also. So uh, that helps uh, eliminate the tax explanations. In terms of effort so, or, or moral hazard, so um, is debt a disciplining device for, for female founded firms? Well, female firms are more likely to have a board and they're more likely to have a larger board. So debt would be redundant. But you know, if we think of them as needing more monitoring or more value added because they're um, inexperienced, that's you know, that could be driving the nature of the board. But if that's what the board is doing, you would expect them to want equity because they would want to be compensated for their effort. So, you know, um, so, so, so I don't think that the disciplining device for debt um, is a likely explanation. If debt is used, used uh, to induce risk taking in, in terms of leaving the entrepreneurs with more equity, so if we think that women are naturally risk averse and, and therefore they need more skin in the game, we would expect riskier outcomes uh, for debt overall, if that's the, the role of debt. 
Of course, anytime we say, well, that's used for women this way and then for the, you know, this way, uh, th these arguments aren't going to be very convincing to you. But, um, you know, it's, it, it's hard to, um, you know, the more complex alternative story one constructs, the harder it is to, to argue against them. So what do I want you to, to take away? Um, that we proposed this very specific form of discrimination that's based on estimating the capital contribution versus the talent contribution of a firm. And that's gonna lead to a higher incidence of debt financing for female founded firms, which of course we observe. And it also gives us, it, it generates the wedge in the funding for high growth entrepreneurship in the following sense. The firms that are more likely to stay independent and go IPO, so where entrepreneurial talent is important, are likely to be underfunded. Whereas the firms that are more likely to be acquired and therefore you don't necessarily see the high growth beyond um, that acquisition date, uh, are likely to be overfunded or at least not underfunded. And so the, the double outcome test uh, supports our model. And we find that these differences subside uh, fairly quickly, both in terms of the staging path and also when uh, firms are older, right? So we, so we think that this is very consistent with information production, uh, reducing bias. And that can be taken as a little bit of good news in the sense that it, it means that investors aren't necessarily, um, you know, unable to learn, I guess we would say, right? So they're trying to get it right. And so any policy levers that we can um, think of that focus on increased experimentation or information production uh, for young entrepreneurial teams uh, should help. On the on, at least on the discrimination in, in the financing realm. So I know I raced through that the end a little bit. Um, we have a couple minutes uh, for questions before the discussant takes over. Well, I think uh, what we'll do is I'll hand it off and then we'll take a Q&A after the discussion. Um, because I, I think the chat has addressed a lot of the questions as well. So thank you, Laura, for a great presentation. We're happy to have Emmanuel Yim Four here presenting his discussion um, of the paper. He's got 15 minutes. I think you're muted. Let's see. You good? Okay. One second. I'm trying to find the unmute button. Can you hear there me? There you are. <laughs> well, thank you so much for inviting me to discuss this paper. I enjoyed reading it. I don't think I've seen a paper on security choice in early stage financing. So there was a little bit of learning there for me. So this paper is about you know, how mistake-based discrimination can affect security choice in early stage financing. Okay, yeah. let me go back a little bit. So the question the authors ask is, does investor bias affect the capital structure decisions of female-led startups? And their main finding is female-led firms are more likely to use debt early on, 20% more likely, and that is not because female-led firms are ran by less competent people because you know, uh, um, they're more likely to IPO and they're less likely to be acquired because investors tend to have a bias that you know, the value of the firm is more driven by physical capital. And they show that the bias declines as more information is produced. So I think it's a good paper tackling an important question. And my main suggestion is going to be about their setting, in particular, their use of Form D data. All right, so the authors are trying to run this regression here, where the Y variable here is an indicator for firms that are using debt. And they're trying to predict whether female-run firms are more likely to use debt, debt financing. Now, why would we expect female-run firms to use debt financing? Well, they have a simple framework to explain this. Uh, 
So for the reasons Laura mentioned, I'm not gonna rehash the combination of physical and human capital, but imagine for a second that investors made the decision of funding a firm with debt or equity, depending on the combination of tangible capital and human capital. So if an investor thought that 50% of firm value was coming from tangible capital and 50% coming from human capital, then they would be indifferent between debt and equity. Now I have Luana over here and I have Emmanuel over here and they have the exact same firm. So the value, 45% of the value of their firm comes from tangible capital and 55% for human capital. Now using the rule I described to you earlier, it is clear that Emmanuel is gonna get funded with equity because a lot of his value is coming from human capital. Now the key of the paper is that Luana's contribution towards firm value gets downgraded. So instead of the 55% that's applied to Emmanuel here, for example, she gets 40% and she gets funded with debt instead. Now, after running that regression, they cannot show you that this is true. And so what they do is they use an outcome test. And the outcome test assumes the following. They assume that the probability of an IPO is increasing in human capital, but the probability of an acquisition is decreasing in human capital. Now, based on this assumption, they show that indeed female run firms are more likely to IPO because they need a higher level of human capital to raise funding. And they're less likely to be acquired again because they have a lower level of physical capital and there's this bias towards assuming that a lot of value in, in these female led firms actually comes from physical capital. Now, the main question I'm gonna be asking are concern some assumptions that are not quite well discussed in the paper in my opinion. So a referee would appreciate a little bit more support of some key assumptions. So for example, does raising debt and filing a form D imply that the firm indeed has more debt? What I'm thinking about using the simple example of Luana and Emmanuel is that Luana might raise less debt than Emmanuel, but she might be more likely to file a form D for other reasons besides the amount of debt that she indeed has raised so far. Another hypothesis is female led firms might be more cautious than male led firms are more likely to file a form D or female led firms might raise debt from non-banks and more on this point again in, in, in a few slides. So let's think about who raises debt and files a form D and it helps to think first of all about what is form D and who is filing form Ds. Well, according to the Securities Act, if you raise, if you sell securities, you must register them or rely on an exemption. Now, suppose Luana raised a million dollars and she was thinking about complying with security laws. What are her options? Well, one thing she can do is she could try to rely on the intrastate exemption. So this within state exemption, and she could use that if 80% of her revenues come from business within the state, if her investors are state residents or an entity that's owned by state residents, or if the investors agree to only resell the securities to other state residents. Now she's an internet business with revenues that come from across the board, she's kind of out of luck. Another thing she could do is she could rely on the across state exemption, but again, the requirements, they are vague. What does it mean, for example, for investors to have enough knowledge to evaluate risks and bear losses? What does it mean for the number of investors to support the conclusion that the offering is not a public offering? And another key burden of relying on the across state exemption is that you have to comply with state regulators in each state where you have investors. Or what she could do is she could rely on the Form D exemption. She could file a Form D within 15 days of raising funding. And that's a safe harbor exemption. It guarantees her private placement exemption. Now, one of the key things of this paper is a bank loan is not a security. And so if a firm raised a lot of bank debt, they are not going to be filing a Form D because a bank loan is not a security and you're not required to file a Form D if you raise bank debt. Now, what can the authors do about this? How can they validate essentially what is this key assumption that if you raise Form D and you file a debt Form D, you check the box that Laura was showing us, you indeed have more debt on your balance sheet. Here's a suggestion. The authors have data from Crunchbase. I'm gonna use PitchBook as a running example here. 
And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the overlap of firms that are filing Form Ds and are also in pitch book because that same bias of firms selecting into the data does not exist with pitch book because pitch book collects data, not just Form D data, but from different industry sources. And so if the authors use data from another source, say pitch book, is it the case that firms that have raised more rounds of debt in pitch book are more likely to file Form Ds is one of the assumptions that I'm going to check. Checking those assumptions also enables the authors to get at which investors are doing the discriminating. More on that again in a few slides. So I'm gonna run the following regressions. I'm gonna predict who files a form D kind of to get a sense of who's filing these forms and who files a form D and checks essentially the debt box. Another added benefit again of doing this validation using an external data source is the authors are using a, 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 an algorithm to predict which startups are female led. By using a data source, for example, that already has this information, the authors can give the reader a little bit more of a sense of how well does the algorithm work and what exactly are its limitations because that's a key independent variable. And so again, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna do two things. I'm gonna first of all predict who is in this intersection, who is using a form D to give everyone a sense of who is in this intersection. And then I'm gonna look at who is checking the box of I raised debt and I filed a form D and does there appear to be any bias that I might explain some of their findings. And so this first column is predicting just who is filing a form D and we see some things that make sense in, 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 in especially given what I told you guys earlier. So we see, for example, that if you're located outside a VC center, so where is that? So these are firms that are not located, for example, in California, Massachusetts or New York, they are less likely to file. So if you're located in a VC center, you're less likely to file a Form D, again, because you can rely on one of those Section 4A2 exemptions where you can raise capital from investors within the state. If your investors are dispersed, so you have investors that are located across the country, then it's more burdensome, for example, to comply with state regulations in each state. And so you're more likely to file a Form D. If you're raising capital from a corporate VC that are less likely to syndicate the deal here, you're, there's no effect really on filing a Form D. And here we see that female-led firms are less likely to file a Form D. And so the question is, does that really survive when we look at who again is filing a Form D and checking the debt box? And, and like I said, a bank loan is not a security and PitchBook has some bank loans. So you can see here that if you're raising more debt rounds, you're less likely to file a Form D. Now, if we look at who, so this is, so let me go back here again. So this is now the, the second column there is really the red. I'm trying to predict who again is checking that box and filing a form D. And so we see here that there's really no bias. And so this is good news for the authors. There's really no bias. The proportion of, if you have more female executives, you're not more likely to file a form D and check the debt box. So it doesn't appear that there's selection into who's filing the forms. And this key assumption that I would have liked to see validated also holds. You can see that if you raise more debt rounds, then you're more likely to file a Form D and check the debt box. If you condition, so let me go back here. If you condition on the intersection, so let me go back right here. If you condition and you ask, who are those, again, that are checking this box and who filed a Form D to get at which investors are doing the discriminating, you can see here that the coefficient on a VC investor goes away and it looks like this bias is really on the part of angel investors. And like Laura said, there's some good news in that they appear to correct this bias in later rounds. And so it's a, it's a nice framework and an empirical test to understand how bias affects capital structure decisions in early stage firms. And my main suggestion would be to use other data to inform the reader about who's raising debt and filing a Form D. By doing that, you can get at the important question of exactly which investors are biased. You can also show that your proxy is correctly identifying female-led firms, either by doing a combination of hand-checking a random sample of say 100, or showing the accuracy using another database such as Crunchbase. And, and like I said, I had not really read a paper on, on, on security design and bias in early stage financing. I, I did notice this paper by Robin Robinson had a very similar regression and the results gonna appear to, to line up with what you guys have. So it would be nice to see a little bit of a discussion on why, on why the results there are, are different. Thank you.
Perfect. Thank you, Emmanuel, for a very interesting discussion. So, uh, Laura and Luana, do you want to take a few minutes uh, to respond, and then we can go into uh, collecting more questions? Sure. Sure. That that was great. Um, what's interesting is, you know, I had thought about. Um, I, I won't say what Luana had thought about, uh, but we we had thought about sort of women being more rule followers and being more likely to file Form B. So it's interesting that that's. Um, uh, not necessarily the result we we see. Um, I had not personally thought about uh, bank debt substituting in in male firms, so that's very very useful and something we should think about um, and, and incorporate into the paper. Uh, with respect to the Robin Robinson finding, um, I think that that's probably a wealth constraint effect. So the way that uh, you know Robinson happens to be on the call, um, the way that they classify debt. Uh, I think personal debt of the founders is, is classified. And so that could, could be driving the difference. So um, th that's, that's what I'll say. And um, I'll open it up from there. Perfect. Uh, Luana, do, do you have anything to add or we can open to questions? No, I just wanted to, can you hear me? Yeah. Right. So, um, sorry. I just wanted to add uh, one, one small thing so that, that uh, the Form D uh, files are, are very helpful in, in uh, sort of picking up firms that really have some sort of ambition in terms of growth. Because when you think about it, uh, if you're only relying on state uh, uh, regulation, then it means that you only want to rely on investors that are close to you. While we really want to look at firms that are, have uh, like ambitions as growing and, and becoming the next you know, big firm uh, listed possibly on the NASDAQ. So, uh it's it, it's a it's a it, it, it we like this sort of constraint on uh, on the regulations that that they were they were looking at that just but there was a thank you very much Emmanuel for 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 uh, pointing that out to the audience because that was a, that was a good point but very cool so uh audience if you have questions feel free to just raise your hand or just unmute yourself and ask uh at the start i think David added the comment about the to reconcile with the uh, Robin Robinson RFS paper. Uh, David, do you want to speak first, and then other people may be getting prepared for questions? No, I, I really don't think I need to add anything. I mean, I, I think that I think that both Laura and Luana were, were right about the sort of key points of difference between the underlying sample and our paper and this paper. I, I'd, I'd much rather hear other people's comments and questions about this paper. Cool. I I saw Adair's hand go up. But I've talked a lot, so if anyone else has, excuse me. No, I, I've already said a lot. I didn't want to crowd the time. If anyone else has questions, why don't you go? Why don't you go ahead, Adair, and and, and, okay. and follow behind you? Okay. So I, you're going to get asked. My guess is about the fact that um, in the IPO and the acquisition, those results, right? You don't have a perfect match by any means on your controls. So here's just some suggestions. I would take all the female ones that are IPO'd, which is going to be a small sample, and I'd find a match that has an almost identical early stage note, uh, early stage amount, because controlling for log size is not going to, you know, the the difference between 250 and 500 is not going to show up in that control. So I would because there's there's a big difference of whether you get a note or a price round if you're doing 250 versus 500, and so you're not picking that up at all, and there, and the other thing I would do also is program something clever so that you get an exact industry match for for the that sample because you can be in healthcare and be devices versus clinicals yes. and, and it's like way different in capital use. So I would make an effort at the end to do as, as much as you can to get some estimations on those outcomes with as precise a match if you can for all the female ones. Just because you're gonna you're gonna get attacked on that, um, and it's a legitimate attack. Yeah. No, so, no, that yeah. that that's totally fair. Um, we we have put in squared terms on amounts uh, for robustness, um, which helps a little bit with the with that concern, but not exact industry match and things of that nature. Um, yeah, I, I will say even though the model is a has a super strong assumption. Um, when we take it to the data, right, that the value threshold doesn't have to be identical, the, it doesn't have to, you know, it can vary by year, it can vary by industry, right? So 
it's a little bit more flexible than the model assumptions, but you're probably looking at that R squared and thinking, well, you're not explaining a whole lot, right? So. I have a quick thought on, on this uh, perfect matching type of uh, concern, which I agree with Adair could be a very crucial one. So I don't know how often it happens that a female founder was replaced by the investor in your sample. It might not actually be very often in recent years, but in previous years, I teach old cases that actually happens quite a, a bit. I wonder, for example, do you see anything or it, it, could that be a setting that you could explore a little bit like a female founder being replaced by an investor or out of certain outcome that actually might be basically looking at the switch of gender of the top executive um, to, to see uh, whether that might be a setting um, to explore. Because you know, a few of my HBS cases, uh, not I wrote it, it's like I, I teach, uh, actually gave me the feeling that there is a sense of um, different gender entrepreneurs uh, face different uh, founding difficulties. And so. so so we've we've looked at that, but we haven't looked at it through time. So that is mm -hmm. interesting. Um, they are female teams are less likely to bring in external executives, um, and they're if if you look at departure of uh, founding teams where the whole team's replaced, there's no difference. Uh, but we haven't. Um, they they might leave slightly sooner if if they they uh, do exit, uh, but we but we haven't looked through time to see, you know, if the early part of the sample is different. But that, that said, our sample isn't all that long. Yeah. I mean, what? Oh, oh sorry. Song, if I if if I can say something about it, we were looking at the. Uh, it's easier to look at the IPO sample because we don't. There's not really that many firms, so you can go through them uh, by hand. So uh, it, it, you know, it, it does. So by the time they get to the IPO, it's not always the case that, they, that the CEO of the firm is a female and the founder, but definitely it is the case that when the firm gets to the IPO stage, it's much more likely to be headed by a female if it was founded by a female, you oh. see what I mean? So uh, it, it is, uh, there's a, a way larger pr proportion of these firms that get to the IPO stage and they're still at the IPO stage, they're headed by the female. So although females may leave the firm as executives and remember there's more than one founder. So female for, for, for obvious reasons uh, uh, in all sorts of jobs so tend to leave the, the leave work uh, like earlier for, for example, family reasons. Still, the case remains that, uh, that uh, um, in most cases, like in, 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 a, in a majority of cases, they're, they're still headed by the, by the female by the time of the IPO. So doing it uh, round by round is a little bit more difficult, but yeah, that's a, that's a great suggestion. Cool. Um... I think that's uh, good. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, a wonderful presentation and very informative discussion. And uh, thank you everyone for joining today. I do have uh, two small announcements. The first one is our Wi-Fi uh, lecture. We'll have one next week on small business bankruptcy. And I think for those of you who are interested, particularly under this context of COVID, that will be a very informative talk. And uh, the presenter will be Kate Waldock uh, from Columbia Law School. And uh, then we also have a program for student run uh, workshop that will be happening on February the 1st. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone. The program is online, so check it out. And uh, thank you again and uh, wish you a very happy uh, rest of the week.